Let's start. So this is the podcast, The Civic Leader. I'm uh, your host. I'm Sylvie Legere, co-founder of The Policy Circle. And today we will be uh, going over a brief that's called Education K-12. through And with me to read this brief is uh, my friend and uh, co-leader of the Rose Friedman Society Policy Circle here in Wilmette, Beth Feely. Beth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to say, uh, since uh, we started, uh, actually, the very Beth and I started the seat in the first policy circle, and uh, and Beth is now, you know, a freelance writer and editor for various nonprofit organizations, including the Woodson Center, and she actually served as a launch director for the 1776 effort. Um, previously, Beth worked in consulting and public relations for Hill and Knowlton and Arthur Anderson and for a variety of Fortune 500 companies. And most recently, also, she served as the, an editor for the Policy Circle. So it's great to have you uh, here. Beth also uh, runs a local civic organization called Nutri Your Neighbors, which promotes common sense policies in local government and schools, which is why I asked Beth to be here, my uh, co reader on. Uh, on this brief on K-12 education, um, given uh, your preoccupation. So the, the, um, the idea of this, uh, of this overview of uh, education, of this brief, is to really provide us with an understanding of what's all involved in education. And um, Beth, for you, maybe you could share with our listeners, you know, what's your primarily perf- perspective or focus when you think about education? Well, of course, as a mother, I I think about education through that lens. Um, I have three children, and of course, when we chose where we were going to live, we wanted them to get a good education. You know, I really think that that is what uh, leads to opportunity. And so certainly a lens as a mother, but then also uh, as a lens, as a, as a taxpayer and a citizen. I really do think that it's in our society's interest to have a well-educated populace. Um, I think it is good to have public options for people, and I want to make sure that those are delivering education in the best way possible. Yeah, I, we're uh, both mothers. I'm also a mother of three. We have like uh, teenagers and uh, went through the whole system, and I have to say that uh, before uh, being part of the policy circle, starting the policy circle, I had never attended a uh, school board meeting and did not really understand the, the administrative aspects of, uh, of education. So for me, it's, and, and I decided to, um, it, it was really important, for, especially for my husband, to send our kids to a public school, and I had never really thought about it. I come from Canada. I come also from a private school, going to private school in Canada. So there's a, a piece of it about education that you look at it through your own experience that you want to transfer to your kids, and also a broader perspective of education as a whole in the country, in your state, and then in the world. So with that, you know, Beth, let's start. And um, we, what we are doing here is we are reading a policy circle brief. These briefs are meant for discussion. They're meant to provide a an overview of an issue. And between each of the sections, we'll have a very brief discussion. But this is about the facts um, that then you could use in your own circle or environments to discuss the topic of education. So I'll start off, um, you know, with, with an introduction that we have here that education is the pathway to a productive life. All people need basic literacy, math skills, knowledge of the world around them to function in today's society and to be informed citizen. But despite increased spending, our educational outcomes as a nation are stagnant. How can the U.S. education system better prepare young people for successful adults and careers? You know, K-12 education is a vast topic with many interlocking parts, and this brief gives an overview of the major topics within education and some ideas for reform with the goal of every student having access to an education that equips them with knowledge and skills they need to succeed in the 21st century. And I think that's actually a really important goal setting when we think about education is to equip equip young people with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in the 21st century. So, um, 
the um, the history. So every brief is constructed with uh, a similar structure, and we always start off with the history of of the issue of the topic that we are discussing. So I'll start with that. Um, as Thomas Jefferson remarked to James Madison, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. The U.S. Constitution does not directly address education. The Tenth Amendment is often cited for the proposition that education falls within the purview of the states. Though the Supreme Court ruled in 1973 that the U.S. Constitution does not guarantee a right to education, the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment is generally interpreted to require the states to provide each child equal access to schooling. According to Kelly McManus of the Education Trust, every state constitution guarantees a right to education, though in varying levels of specificity. Education started out as a private enterprise, becoming a public endeavor in response to the rapid population growth and mass immigration in the 19th century, with the goal of providing social order among a great number of children from a variety of backgrounds. Brookings Institute scholar Ron Haskin and Isabel Sawhill, in their well-known approach termed the success sequence, identify education as the first of three steps to be taken for one to join the middle class. At least finish high school, get a full-time job, and wait until age 21 to get married and have children. Our research shows that of American adults who followed these three simple rules, only about 2% are in poverty and nearly 75% have joined the middle class. A quality education provides the foundation upon which one can build a productive life. Um, so it's interesting, you know, in the brief, there's also some key facts. And, and there's one that I think is, is particularly interesting is Andrew Johnson first created a federal Department of Education in 1867, which was abolished a year later. And Jimmy Carter relaunched it in 1979. I didn't realize that. Um, you know, in Canada, there is no national ministry of education. It's all uh left to the provinces and to implement education systems. So it's kind of interesting. The The other fact is uh, that the U.S. Department of Education contributes roughly 8% of the elementary and secondary education budget with state and local governments funding the remaining 92%. So, Beth, do you have like, some thoughts on the history? I, too, was surprised that the Department of Education had been created so long ago and then was abolished for well over 100 years. I hadn't realized that. And I know that there are some who today challenge the necessity of having a national level, like federal level uh, education uh, department. Um, so I, I just I, that was pretty surprising to me. You know, it really is carried out at the state and local level. Um, and that funding statistic that you just stated uh, reinforces that. Um, but it is, it, yeah, it's interesting to see that, you know, I think the philosophy that it is a really should be closest to the people uh, is reflected in the way that we have our education set up, uh, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Challenges in today's K through 12 education system. Despite increased spending, U.S. schools are not producing better outcomes and student performance has fallen behind other countries. Access to quality education remains a challenge for people in low-income zip codes, which affects economic opportunity and mobility. The following sections outline the major issues related to K-12 education, from spending and funding to student and teacher performance and other issues relating to accessing quality education, followed by some ideas for reform. Expenditures versus results. Did you know that the entire education market is roughly $1.3 trillion? The U.S. Department of Education states it contributes roughly 8% of the elementary and secondary education budget, with state and local governments funding the remaining 92%. In the 2015-2016 school year, the National Educators Association found that average K-12 public education funding was divided somewhat evenly between local governments, 44.4%, and state governments, 46.4%, though this varies by state and locality. Just over half of all education spending goes to the cl in classroom instruction. 
Between 1992 and 2014, while student enrollment grew nationally by 20%, non-teaching staff grew by 47%. Professor Ben Scafidi, who authored the study, Back to the Staffing Surge, outlined the issue this way. Given the massive increase in public school personnel, well over and beyond what was needed to accommodate student enrollment growth, given the data on stagnant student achievement in public schools over time, and given that students in recent years have characteristics that are slightly more favorable for student achievement, the productivity of American public schools has fallen rather dramatically over the past few decades. And, in retrospect, the staffing surge in American public schools has appeared to have been a costly failure. Between 1950 and 2015, teacher staffing levels increased at a rate two and a half times faster than student enrollment. Non-teaching staff and administration increased seven times faster. You can read this study or watch the eight-minute video provided in the brief for a video synopsis. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the national average for per-pupil spending in 2015 was $12,903. Per pupil spending by state varies widely. In 2015, Washington, D.C. spent the most per pupil at $27,810, about double the national average. And Idaho spent the least per pupil at $7,858. But what matters most is how those dollars are spent. Higher spending doesn't always equate with better classroom outcomes. Studies from the Cato Institute have found no link between education spending and student achievement. CBS reports, American students have remained internationally mediocre since 1970, even amid a tripling in inflation-adjusted dollars being spent per student. A national public radio analysis finds that U.S. students are not in the global top 20 for math, reading, or science scores. In 2018, the National Assessment of Educational Progress released the nation's report card, the results of which revealed little change in student performance since 2011. It is important to note that this trend was preceded by fairly significant improvement in the 2000s, which many people attribute to the stronger accountability systems that had been put into place. So I, I think it's it's really interesting to uh, really look at the the growth of the administrative staff. I, I was stunned at the seven times faster figure. Yeah, uh, and then it's interesting to go to your school district, and it's actually rather easy because it should be it's public information is to see the salaries of the administrative staff in your school district and um and that's really informative i know like i went through that exercise in in our school district and uh it's it's surprising the the levels and uh and the number of people in administration it is and those those positions tend to get created and not necessarily go away and then they also have pensions that are tied to them and that really becomes obviously a burden for the states that are paying those pensions um, as well. And in particular, a state like ours, they are fairly lucrative deals. And so, no, it was it was very eye-opening to see some of these statistics and just the whole notion of the professionalization of uh, the education system. Um, I think this is one of those results is that you have, you know, some very qualified people. I think you do need a strong administration. I think they should be well compensated. But wow, when it's increasing at seven times faster, um, student enrollment, yes, you do kind of wonder about you the value of that. <laughs> and sometimes you, you see like a school district that manages like 2,000 students and uh, and then and then you see the level of administration and then you compare it to companies um, that have so many more c- customers and, and they deliver so much output with a, a much smaller, leaner team. And, and as you said, it's not something that's always questioned. It's like, well, do we need all of these costs? And there might be point in time, are there more um, efficient ways of getting the expertise when we need it and then releasing it as contractors instead of creating a full-time position? I think it's sometimes government administration don't necessarily think that way. No, so. no. I think a lot of times once budgets are in place, it's how do we spend the money, not do we need to spend less or, you know, right. more. Yeah, there's very little incentive for that. So um, funding gaps across the school is one of the big challenges, right? As outlined in this recent report by the Education Trust, 
In the U.S. today, school districts serving the largest populations of African American, Latinos, or uh, American Indian students receive roughly $1,800 or 13% less per student in state and local funding than those serving the fewest students of color. And where is the quote here? This may seem like an insignificant amount, but it adds up. For a school district with 5,000 students, a gap of $1,800 per student means a shortage of $9 million per year, which makes a big difference. The American Action Forum writes that Public school systems in low socioeconomic status communities are often under-resourced, negatively affecting students' academic progress. Multiple research studies have shown that providing educational options create a more competitive, productive school system for all and leads to improved academic outcomes. Their report identifies studies by Paul E. Peterson, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, and Brookings Institution slash Harvard University that all point to improve outcomes in terms of graduation rates and college enrollment when parents are given choice to find the best school fit for their children, particularly among low-income and minority students group. Some challenges associated with school choice options as identified by families in distressed communities, is difficulty accessing schools outside of one's neighborhood because the public bus system does not service private and charter schools. Another interesting anecdote parents identified was the value of having a teacher that understands and relates to their student, sometimes something that was noted as missing in some private and charter school settings. So that gap is a real issue, especially when when schools are funded by the state, but also the, the, the local government, the city, and the distribution. And, and it is where when you have more options, different funding sources for schools, you can provide people with choices that will fit their kids uh, and their families better. So. Yeah, that whole idea of finding the best school fit, I think, really needs to be underscored because I think the one-size-fits-all government option is not necessarily a good fit for many students. And I think it's parents who best know their children. And so the notion that when you can give parents some more choice and making that best fit for their child, uh, the child is going to do better in school, um, you know, which increases likelihood of success in whatever you know, path they choose. And um, but it's also interesting that sometimes it's not a cure all and that there are some real challenges. I thought the logistical challenge of just even getting to the school is a real thing. It's a reality. Yeah. Um, And it's always a consideration when choosing a school. mm -hmm. I find also um, giving families the um, the ability to choose where to go to school is an empowerment. It's it's very empowering for the family, for the child to make that choice. And it's kind of a first step towards, you know, being in charge of your destiny in a way. So, um, so I agree. Beth, do you want to take the next section? Sure. So we'll move on to uh, student performance in the U.S. versus compared with other countries. U.S. student performance has remained stagnant amidst higher spending, with MBR reporting that America's high school graduates resemble other countries' dropouts. According to the Pew Research Center, one of the biggest cross-national tests is the Program for International Student Assessment, which every three years measures reading ability, math, and science literacy, and other key skills among 15-year-olds in dozens of developed and developing countries. The most recent PISA results from 2015 placed the U.S. at an unimpressive 38th out of 71 countries in math and 24th in science. Gene Allen, founder and CEO of the Center for Education Reform in Washington, D.C., notes that Florida was the only state to show significant gains in the 2018 Nations Report Card mentioned earlier, particularly across minority and disadvantaged populations. And she's quoted saying, While most states saw no significant improvement, the state of Florida and two of its biggest districts, Miami and Duval, achieved unprecedented gains. Significant gains were made across the board by low-income students, students of color, and students with disabilities. 
That's because starting in 1999 and consistently since, Florida adopted measures that held schools, students, and communities accountable for results, which is a common theme that once you start measuring and once you start taking a look at you know, what you put in versus what you're getting out, uh, you tend to get better results. You tend to see improvement um, and you identify places where you need to tweak and where you need to make some decisions about redeploying resources. Uh, so I think that makes a lot of sense. I think, though, comparing the U.S. performance with other countries always needs to come with an asterisk because in the U.S., we provide the same education opportunity to everyone and that same high school experience. Everywhere else in the world, your path gets determine much earlier on based on your academic results. You know, you get tracked in, in Germany, for instance, based on your academic results. You either go to gymnasium or you don't. You go to a more professional track early, like at 13, 14. You know, everywhere, everywhere else, you're also your early academic result will determine whether you go in a science track, in a social studies track, in a, in a professional track. So that, I think, really impacts the overall, you know, performance scores um, that, that we see when we compare ourselves internationally, when, you know, it depends on who's taking the test, right? <laughs> like, so if you just have your best students take the test, then, of course, they're going to rank a lot higher. So I'd like to see that perspective Accounted for, yeah right in those measures that's a great perspective and i appreciate you bringing that because you you know grew up in a different country that uh, might have had a slightly different system and you know the other thing about other countries as well um, I know that in India and China and South Korea, I believe that the education system um, focuses a little bit more on uh, drilling and some different educational approaches, which could account also for their superior. And I don't, I'm not sure from this if we know where they fell, but yeah. they tend to they tend to score better in math and science and some of this top the top. Yeah, right, because of the approach mm -hmm. of teaching also. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, these international metrics, it's always I think we always have it, and and also their intent is often to just make the U.S. Them look great. I mean, just uh, right. But that you know. But that said, I mean, you know, we should we should want to we, be at the top. We should want to be in the middle. You know. No, I want. I think we should seek to uh, you know seek to perform uh, you know at the top. We have resources far greater than most countries. I mean, there's really not much of an excuse that we should not be absolutely performing at the top. Absolutely. All right, so I'll take, you know, the, the next section is around uh, teacher performance, the other challenge, right? We're going through kind of all of these challenges in education. So we talked about funding, we talked about student performance, and now there's like teacher performance and the role of unions. Um, teacher quality matters greatly when it comes to student outcomes. A study in the National Bureau of Economic Research found that replacing Poor performing teachers, those with value-added scores in the bottom 5%, with an average teacher increases the present value of students' lifetime income by more than 250000 for the average classroom. I mean, the effect, that, that is staggering number. And it, like, think about that, right? Replacing a poor performing teacher with an average teacher, not a great teacher, increases the present value of students' lifetime income by more than $250,000 for the average classroom. It's, that's an incredible study. And there's a link to this study here. Hoover Institute senior fellow Eric Hanushek in his comments on the study writes that evidence shows that bad teachers cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost income and productivity each year that they remain in the classroom. These costs are large enough that failing to address them is simply inexcusable. It is time that we develop policies that truly are designed to help our children and not just the adults in the school today. This strong statement. Teachers' union exert a large amount of influence over public education at the national, state, and local levels and have been long accused of protecting poor performing teachers. This article from The Atlantic outlines examples from California of how difficult it is to remove teachers from the classroom. 
Conversely, this Washington Post article references a report supported by a pro-union group that counters these charges, saying, by demanding higher salaries for teachers, unions give school districts a strong incentive to dismiss ineffective teachers before they get tenure. Teachers and unions are also well documented as being highly political. For the 2016 election cycle alone, teachers union donated $32 million to political campaigns. 93% of the money given directly to politicians went to Democrats. National Educators Association is the largest teachers union representing over 3 million teachers. Education supports support professionals staff, administrators, retired educators, and students preparing to become teachers. This exit speech by the NEA former general counsel Bob Chenin outlines his views on the power of the teachers' unions as effective advocates. So there's a, there's a video here that you could watch later. Um, as for correlating school performance with the presence and strength of teachers' unions, opinions vary. The Thomas B. Fordham Institute found that the states with highest gain in student performance did not have the strongest union presence. Conversely, Matthew DiCarlo at, of the Albert Schenker Foundation, funded by the second largest teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers, found that the presence of teacher contracts in the state has a positive effect on achievement. The recent Supreme Court decision in Janus versus um, Axme found that public sector unions cannot compel members to pay dues because they are an inherently political organization. This case could have a large impact upon all public sector union membership, including teachers' union and their related influence. What I thought was interesting here that I did not realize is we call it teachers' union, but again, it does not just include teachers. It includes professionals, um, staff, administrators, retired educators. It, it, it includes a lot of people. And I feel like that's diluting the, um, the value, perhaps, of a teacher's union and, and also that it's a national level. Like, shouldn't like a union be really local and, and specific to the community in which it is instead of related to national? I don't know, you know, your thoughts there. Well, and I, I think that usually at the local level, they roll up to the national level. So, out, for example, here, I believe our educate our Woman Educators Association rolls up to the NEA eventually. I, you know, I think in general, and if you watch the video, um, the, the teachers, or rather the unions, they clearly are representing the interests of the adults that are in the system. And so sometimes that can cross over into the interest of children, and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I think that kind of is the example of uh, teacher, teachers' unions are well known to protect teachers who really should not be in a classroom anymore. And that's a negative effect. Um, I think the union, when it puts the well-being of a teacher over the well-being of their the, the children in the room, that, that is a, that's a real problem. Uh, I was... I was stunned at the amount of money, um, not super surprised at where the money went. I had always long suspected that in terms of it having a little bit more of a, well, a lot of a, more of a, of a Democrat uh, slant to the giving, but $32 million to a political campaign. I, that, the Janus decision, you know, I think they made the right call that they are inherently political organizations. When you are donating as a body to that many campaigns, um, and I suppose understandably because teachers are public, they're government employees, and so they're going to donate to campaigns that will create policies that will benefit them, you know, the government policies right, that will the benefit could them. could go to professional development, to development of the of the teachers, right, in, in, in really enhancing their ability to be effective in the classroom or even... Even it could go back to uh, developing uh, students be to become teachers, right? So it could, so yeah, no, it could. <laughs> I mean, it could. I mean, that's thirty-two million dollars. That's a that's a that's a big amount that's going to campaigns, and and that members don't 
necessarily endorse all the same candidates. So that's always, I think, in the, um, one, they, one thing to consider. Right. Well, they don't. And that was the gist of the uh, Janice versus AFSCME uh, finding is that teachers now don't have to uh, pay their dues. I do think there's still somewhat of a, um, um, you know, ostracist, ostracist, that's too hard of a word. <laughs> Um, I think there's still a lot of pressure, I'd say peer pressure, uh, for teachers to join the union. I think now that they don't have to, they now have the right not to, but I do think you are still sometimes viewed as an outlier. Completely, yeah, yeah. Completely um, excluded, or maybe you need to create a different form of, of advocating for, right. for conditions in your environment, but usually you're part of a community. And I, and I, I mean, I wonder the need for truly for your union in, in a school system where it's really part of a community and you have to, I don't know, feel like the, the, you know, the environment, the work environment is in the best interest of everyone so that they could be effective in, in teaching our kids. I don't know. It's hard to um, say and interesting, and this will uh, lead into the next section. I think what teachers unions largely do is they represent their members in terms of um, compensation. Right, and bar- uh, just the competition, not just yeah. the work. Yeah, right. Um, so, so I think so. So we'll, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll just cover that. Um, you know, I think for in a circle conversation, this is where it's interesting if you want to bring in different perspective to invite someone who is you know part of the teachers union and have a full on discussion around union in your school district, right, and what they do and how the money is being used and and uh, and the effectiveness or you know of of um, of the union in your in your school so so moving on to teacher compensation and pensions teacher compensation and development is also an important topic of discussion in education as not all schools are equipped to support and promote strong teachers while identifying and addressing problems created by weak teachers One of the most significant research reports of the past decade was the New Teacher Project, an organization that works with districts and charter schools on talent management. Its report, called The Widget Effect, sparked a conversation about teacher quality, stating, Our research confirms what is by now common knowledge. Tenured teachers are identified as ineffective and dismissed from employment with exceptional infrequency. While an important finding in its own right, we have come to understand that infrequent teacher dismissals are in fact just one symptom of a larger, more fundamental crisis. The inability of our schools to assess instructional performance accurately or to act on this information in meaningful ways. So Public Impact's Opportunity Culture Report offers an innovative look at rethinking the teaching profession and how it's structured. For, research, or for resources on teacher preparedness and strategic compensation stru- uh, structures, you can visit the National Council on Teacher Quality's website, and you can click through in the brief there to read more. Teacher strikes across the country in recent years have brought attention to issues such as declining teacher pay. But in many cases where school funding has gone up, instead of increasing teacher pay, which some argue has not kept up with other professional level salaries, Increased spending has gone to non-classroom staff and pension and benefit payments. And in some cases, those payments go only to paying down pension debt, not to funding better benefits for current teachers. As education scholar Frederick Hess writes, in the case of Kentucky, where teachers have been fighting pension reform, Alderman, who is a former Obama staffer, has calculated that if the state wasn't forced to spend vast sums paying down pension debt, teacher salaries would be $11,400 higher than today. Um, I know that pension debt is, a, is a, an issue for many states, um, and so uh, this is an important point here. And we mentioned it earlier that it's not only, it's not only uh, uh, salary pay, um, a lot of times the benefits and the pensions that teachers accrue um, and some of the laws outlining how that happens uh, can become really almost, you know, uh, crushing debt for states to take on. So unaffordable pensions and benefit packages for teachers and other public sector employees are a drain on many states' finances. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, the gap between the total assets reported by state pension systems across the United States and the benefits promised to workers, now reported as the net pension liability, reached $1.1 trillion in fiscal year 2015 the most recent year for which complete data are available. That represents an increase of $157 billion, or 17% from 2014. 
To address the spiraling pension costs, some states are moving to hybrid plans for government workers' retirement plans, including for teachers. But funding to pay for existing obligations remains a challenge that many states have yet to figure out. So pensions is a whole other issue of the whole the education system. So we went through the school funding. We talked about teacher performance, measuring that performance, and then there's the management of the pensions, which can be a whole issue in itself. It can so, be. And and one thing for people is. to figure out or think about as you're reading this, um, and it applies to teachers as well as all government workers, a lot of these pension programs um, are simply not available to a lot of the people who end up paying for these pension programs. Like your regular private sector worker normally does not have a pension. That is, that's a bit of an antiquated concept. You know, most people have 401ks or other types of retirement plans. And so as people read up on pension situations in their own states, they should really take a look at what those obligations are and then compare it to what you and your neighbors um, have in terms of providing for your retirements. And so, um, yeah, no, no, that's a, a really good point. I mean, that's, and, and in looking at the pe- what's offered as pension to teachers in your district compared to uh, people in your community, and and they should be equivalent, right? They should be equivalent. They should, and it so. also is it's publicly available information, so you can Google it, um, and you should be able to come up with some figures if you want to do a little digging. Yeah. Um, so there's other topics of educate in uh, the education era arena. Uh, one is early childhood education. So we'll go through these these different topics, and again, the idea is then for you to say, well, you know, I'm really interested in pensions. I'm really interested in early childhood education and, and find your focus and your line of engagement. Uh, so early childhood education. Research is clear that a high quality early childhood education is critical for students' success. While a highly personal decision and a space filled with a variety of providers from daycare to school-based programs to friends and family care, there is general consensus about what constitutes a quality program, regardless of its setting. Early childhood education is also increasingly being seen as a workforce issue, both for working parents and for addressing learning gaps early, with interest growing from a variety of sectors, including from the business community. Quality early childhood education is costly, and there is a debate as to whether funding should be public, private, or a combination. Studies show that Head Start, the primary federal investment in early childhood, and other high-quality publicly funded pre-K programs have a large effect on students when they are in the program, but that those benefits dissipate over time. However, many believe that dissipation of the benefits is due to students going from a high-quality personalized program to a low-performing elementary school that doesn't continue to push them. This phenomenon underscores the need to rethink the education system so all students have access to a quality education regardless of zip code. Um, Early childhood education is an issue like when kids start school with a basic understanding of simple concepts such as number line or the alphabets or greater big. It, it is it is it is an issue and um, and and that, I think that's what also impacts the long-term performance of students in each of the school districts. And there I think is also a really broad number of perspectives as to what early childhood education should be. I mean, I think some people think it should be very play-based. Some people think it should be more Montessori-based. I remember running into a woman at our local beach one summer, and her child was about the same age as mine, four at the time. And I asked, I said, so where does your daughter go to preschool? And she looked at me, she goes, she doesn't need to go to school until she's in kindergarten. I think culturally that that was just, or, or perhaps it was just her family, but um, I don't think that means the child wasn't learning anything. I just think that that people have very, uh, very different views on what's appropriate for a child. Obviously, having them engaged in learning some basic concepts so that they can be prepared for kindergarten is important. Um, and it makes, you know, if, if there were to be a national early childhood education program, who, whose form would win? I don't know. You know, it's, so it's kind yeah, of that's interesting. Right. There's very different approaches. Yeah, um, right. Some are very didactic. Yeah. Some are very play-based. Mm-hmm. And and again, uh, I think you know, if you look 
in Germany or you look in, in other systems, some are very play-based and, and mm-hmm. you're learning about just working with other people, socializing, Social skills, discovering right. your world and becoming a lifelong learner mm-hmm. uh, as well. So that is, it's, it's really good point that there's very different views and you only know these views when you become a parent. <laughs> so, that is- that's true. Or an I, aunt or, a, or, or an aunt or, but, you know, and you're interacting with kids because when it comes to early education, it's interesting from my own experience. You know, I always thought I was very structured and wanted a very rigorous program. And then I had my own children and ended up being one of those people preferring a play based approach and was really anti, um, you know, drills and worksheets. And I was really against it, which totally surprised me. I would not have expected that of myself. So that's this, the beauty of having children. That is, that's <laughs> right. You learn an that's awful right. lot about yourself. Um, I just wanted to hit one other part of this. And I thought it was fascinating, the, you know, the notion that early childhood um, education can have a huge impact. But and I suppose it's kind of heartbreaking that we're not sure that if if that because kids don't have good schools that that keep them on a path, that that's why they lose whatever skills and knowledge that they had earlier. And so, I mean, there could probably be a brief just on that one paragraph there alone. Yeah, that's so. right. And actually, we do have circles in um, Indiana who really focused on education. So this is another thing that you could pick on one topic and decide to go really deep. And they actually made recommendations uh, to the state of Indiana on early education. That's great. So, you know, so the next section is is uh, rural education, Beth. Okay, so with rural education, uh, inner cities are not the only places struggling to create quality options for education. Rural areas present a challenge in terms of quality options that can be scaled given low populations of students and difficulty recruiting teachers. Charter networks that some look to for positive competition that increases the value of all educational institutions are not likely to scale efficiently in a rural setting. Online education could be a cost-effective means to fill gaps in the teaching ranks and offer more course choice and access. You can refer to Jeb Bush's Foundation for Edu- Excellent Education resource, which you can click through to on the, in the brief. But the quality of online schools varies greatly, and reliable high-speed internet access is a technological challenge in many rural areas. So career and technical education is also, and we do have a brief that is really focused on the higher education, so this is just really a touch on. In the past, career and technical education, CTE is uh, the acronym, was dismissed as vocational education for those who couldn't do college prep level work and often included a disproportionate numbers of low-income students of color and students with disabilities. However, Given the needs of the current economy, the career and technical education community is increasingly viewed as much more than just auto mechanics and other vocational classes. Programs such as p started in New York and a partnership with IBM and other programs incorporate dual enrollment opportunities with the local community college or apprenticeships. With career and technical education, business engagement is critical to ensuring that students are actually getting skills that are lead to employment, especially in the local job market. And this is where somehow it's completely taken out of high school, where it used to be, and in a lot of countries that that we look up to, such as Germany, it's very much part of the K-12 education program where early on a technical track is is offered as an option. And not to say that later on you can access to college, you could go to college, but with people having different developmental um, uh, path to even, education. And even just interests. Some, and interests. Some people don't want higher education. They don't want a philosophy degree. They actually want to learn how engines work and how to take them apart and put them together. And we have such a need for this in the economy that it is good to see. It seems like there was a swing, oh, I don't know how long ago, 10, 20 years ago, saying that everyone needs a, a college education. And it's not that that's a bad, lofty goal, but I think it's if if that person wants one. And, um, and the truth is, is that we have so many unmet needs and then also uh, just instances where this you can make a great living doing a lot of the 
professions that you can get or the jobs that you can get from having uh, a technical education. And so it's good to see that this does seem to be making some headway. And if I can encourage people to definitely check out the brief called Creating Career Pathways, uh, it is, it's really good. And it was actually the topic of our summit a couple of years ago. That's right. And it was, it was excellent. There are so many good examples of some really innovative programs. One of the about. things, one of the issues here with career and technical education is really removing the stigma that you are not good enough for college. Mm-hmm. Like we need to remove that language that there's this hierarchy in, in the, in the skill set and, and put them in, in a way at the same level, because there are no not essential jobs and there's just a path for everyone and it needs to be valued the same way. And that is a stigma. I think that, that this is where, you know, the, the public, our governments, we need to change it or, or even businesses. And I know businesses organize um, career fairs so that parents embrace this idea that their kid who could earn a very good living pursuing a technical career and a vocational track. And that needs to be a family um, engagement. Um, So, all right, um, programs to reduce summer loss. So another issue particularly affecting low-income communities is summer loss. That is students who essentially forget material they learned over the summer and thus start the year behind where they should be. Brookings reviewed studies and found, one, that students' achievement scores declined over summer vacation by one month worth of school year learning, and and Black and Latino families tended to learn less during the year and lose more over the summer, therefore widening the gap. Also in the article, Brookings identifies several programs can help Several programs can help with summer loss, including home-based reading programs, such as Reads for Summer Learning, and sending simple text messages that provide ideas, direction, and encouragement for parents and students. So with these issues and topic at hand, um, you know, the next step is what is the role of government and what are some ideas of reform? Well, and, and just uh, backing up just for one point about this section, We here in the United States, our school system and calendar is still based on basically an agricultural calendar. And so you could get rid of summer loss if maybe we rethought the number of months that we go to school. You know, is there a better way to do this? It's always um, been interesting to me that that hasn't been a real push. And perhaps that's right. People (laughs) (laughs) should maybe get like the current school. I don't don't think think that would ever fly. So it's like, but it's, but we are, I'm not sure. Uh, this would be interesting. How many other countries do their calendar like we do? Uh, I know in I Asia, when I does. when I lived in Japan, no, they go year round. They have a much different uh, oh, way of doing yeah. that. And then if they're not in school, they're in extra school. So yeah, it right. is different. But it is yeah, different. yeah, you're right. In that Japan, would be a tall tall order. It would be a so, tall yeah, order to so give up summer <laughs> vacation. I don't know <laughs> where you start there. <laughs> All right. So so what is the role of government uh, and and some ideas for reform? So state and local governments play the predominant role in setting education policy, but the federal government has historically exercised significant influence by tying federal funds to the achievement of federal guidelines. So at the federal level, free market proponents generally do not believe that our education system can be fixed from Washington, for example, with Common Core standards, but rather prefer that the federal government support and enable reform that allows state and local policymakers, educators, and administrators to create better learning environments for students. The Every Student Succeeds Act, the latest version of No Child Left Behind, requires states to report per pupil spending to enable various return on investment metrics and to remind K through 12 administrators that they have an obligation to use taxpayer dollars wisely. Uh, For more, you can read Frederick Hess's argument for these reforms uh, that increase transparency and there is a a click through in the brief. So state and local governments uh, are overseen by elected and appointed school boards have long had primary responsibility for public K-12 education. In general terms, children are assigned to public schools based on geography. Schools within a town or a county belong to a school public school district. Each district obtains funding from the state, largely financed by income and sales taxation, and sometimes even lotteries. 
In addition, as a government unit, a district itself may have the authority to levy taxes as part of the local property tax system. Some support this geographic assignment and combined state and local funding and advocate for additional resources, higher teacher pay, smaller class sizes as a pathway to improve education. Theoretically, it makes sense to keep school funding sources as close to the consumers of those services as possible for transparency and accountability, but provide alternatives for those areas whose property tax base cannot generate enough needed revenue. States are in the position to legislate reforms that can empower parents to make the best fit decision when it comes, when it comes to education for their children. Ideas for reform can be found in the following section. So do you want to talk a little bit about funding? And I, I think it belongs. I mean, the whole notion that states and local governments should be in charge of the funding for schools, to me, makes a lot of sense. I do think, as we referred to earlier, the 14th Amendment says that education is a, well, is interpreted to say that education's a state and local issue. Um, but the whole unevenness of it, you know, it is, it is. It's an issue. Um, I'm not sure what the magic solution is, um, but it is something that here's one thing you should definitely be doing is going to your school board meetings and understanding and looking up the budgets and really understanding what your taxes, you know, what those go to pay for and how they're being spent, um, because that's what that's what the school board is for. They're supposed to be overseeing you know, the good spending of the money that is being gathered by residents who who believe in a public school system. Um, well, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but they're paying for it. And, um, you know, it's just interesting that you actually can learn a lot um, by becoming more familiar with it. And um, in some cases, it can be pretty eye-opening, but that's really the first step. Um, and, you know, the, the notion that this is a state and local issue kind of necessitates that then you need state and, state and local people to participate. And so... Yeah, that's a, right. As well as businesses, because if we always go back to the original goal of education is to be equipped to live a, a good life in the 21st century. And I feel like that's where, you know, businesses, this partnership with bi local businesses involve in the local school system so that we, we develop people who can who can then work and f find career pathways in their community. And, and that's something that's not um, heard about very often, and that could be a, a really good even community discussion uh, forum on, th on this topic. That's a great point. No, you're right. That is not discussed or thought of very often, and um, so that is, that is important. So uh, one other element in terms of the role of government uh, is actually community-based organizations. And so those are public and private organizations that address the needs of a specific geographic area, and they can play a role in improving educational outcomes. Um, so kind of sounding like maybe an, an association of groups. And they, offer, offer, uh, they often offer mentoring programs and other supportive programs to increase success rates in school. So according to a white paper by the Institute for Higher Education Policy, which you can click through to on the brief, in 2009, the American Youth Policy Forum found that students who participated in community-based programs were more likely to be engaged in school, take advanced courses, apply for financial aid, enroll in college, and earn post-secondary degrees and employment. Uh, so certainly an area to look into um, and to, to find out what's happening in your neighborhood or uh, perhaps in neighborhoods which, which need a little bit more hands-on in terms of keeping kids at school uh, and helping them succeed. Um, not to mention, my guess is that there are opportunities where you can serve um, as a mentor and, and help in that way. Yeah, that's right. So principles of reform. So the heart of the education reform debate centers around enabling families to have access to a quality education option for their children. Implementing a market dynamic to the education system to offer parents a choice, sometimes called school choice, can bring competition, which tends to generate better quality options, especially for those with specific educational needs or who live in poor performing school districts. It is interesting to note that a majority of families involved in publicly funded parent choice programs come from low income communities. Meanwhile, Many low-income families see the public school in their community as an important cornerstone that they want to see succeed in a way that helps their children and community flourish. Student First 
is an education reform organization founded by well-known education reformer and, and former chancellor of D.C. Public School, Michelle Rhee, now part of education advocacy group 50can.org. The group outlined five uh, principles for promoting great, great schools, which can serve as guiding principles for reforming education. So one is transparency. Great schools openly engage their community. Parents deserve high-quality, easy-to-understand information about school performance and finances. Choice. Every child is different. Parents should be able to choose an educational option that meets their child's unique needs. Accountability. Schools should be expected to effectively serve all of their students. When they don't, they must improve. Equity. Every child, regardless of background, zip code, or family income, should be able to attend a great school. And flexibility. Schools and districts must be encouraged to innovate, not held back by needless bureaucratic restrictions. So free market advocates tend to be proponents of parent choice, which empowers parents to choose the school that best fits their children's educational needs, can be especially beneficial to low-income families, and promotes greater equality and access to high-quality education. Public education advocates tend to think that parent choice aims to dismantle public education and will increase inequality for disadvantaged families. An argument against school choice is outlined in this Salon article. There's a link to it. Perhaps the largest opportunity for reform is to increase parent choice through child charters, vouchers, education saving accounts, and tax credit scholarships. And following our overviews of these various options. So for charter schools, these are publicly funded, privately run schools, which enroll about 3.1 million students in 43 states. Charter schools have governing bodies, but are not governed by a traditional school board, as other public schools are. And included is a video by The 74 that uh, answers eight questions about charter schools. So you can click on that video uh, in the brief. KIPP Academies is also an excellent example of a successful charter school network. Um, And there's another link there to an overview video, video of KIPP Academies there. So for vouchers, according to edchoice.org, school vouchers give parents the freedom to choose a private school for their children, using all or part of the public funding set aside for their children's education. Under such a program, funds typically spent by a school district would be allocated to a participating family in the form of a voucher to pay partial or full tuition for their child's private school, including both religious and non-religious options. And uh, 15 states and Washington, D.C. have voucher programs. And as far as tax credit scholarships, a similar policy to some of the above is the provision of tax credit scholarships, which allow taxpayers to receive full or partial tax credits when they donate to nonprofits that provide private school scholarships. Eligible taxpayers can include both individuals and businesses. And in some states, scholarship giving nonprofits also provide innovation grants to public schools and or transportation assistance to students choosing alternative public schools. And right now, this program exists in 17 states. And there is a PragerU video included um, where Denisha Merriweather explains how a tax credit scholarship helped her attend school. And I would also mention, if you have not seen the movie Miss Virginia, which is about how the D.C. tax scholarship credit uh, program started, it is inspiring. It's a a great watch, um, great for families, and kind of gives a firsthand account of how a single mom basically uh, made that happen uh, in in Washington, D.C. So education savings accounts are a more recent innovation in parent choice programs, and they allow parents to withdraw their children from a public school district or a charter school and to receive a deposit of the public funds into a government-authorized savings account where you have restricted but multiple uses for um, that you can use the money for. So, f- for example, private school tuition or for outside educational services. And there is a video from Ed Choice that is included um, here that you can click on and learn more about education savings accounts. And some other ideas for reform include making it easier to hire and reward, and if necessary, fire teachers based on performance and qualifications, um, and creating new pathways for teachers to reach the classrooms. For example, 
to recognize other types of qualifications um, for them to obtain teaching jobs. Also, making it easier to dismiss poorly performing teachers and re rewarding high performers. Uh, giving principals more flexibility to make these decisions, such as hiring and firing, setting school schedules, etc., and exploring very, uh, varied teacher compensation models. Another idea for, uh, for reform is to promote the options of dedicated career and technical training high schools and programs in, uh, in high schools, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. Also promoting the use of community-based organizations, which we also talked about, especially in underprivileged neighborhoods, um, as a method for improving student performance. And then also the summer loss programs, um, better early childhood options, and then also better access to online education uh, options, and especially uh, making sure that there are high-speed internet um, access in rural areas, which really, they do have challenges that uh, many of us who live in, in larger areas that we can't contemplate and that we probably take for granted. Yeah, and uh, we are recording this uh, th this during a quarantine, and so many schools and children are locked at home and have to uh, go online, and some school districts are really not ready to deliver education uh, through, um, through e-learning, even though there are so many resources available out there. Um, the platforms, people may not have access to the right platforms in order to follow these programs. So that's something that's often not, it's kind of a blind spot in in the um, in a school district and in their planning and the way they allocate their resources to ensure that everyone is up to speed to be able to continue an education from home in case something happens. It might be a health issue, it might be this quarantine situation mm -hmm. that we're in, but it, it should really be part of being able to provide individualized learning uh, to kids. Well, and, and I wonder if a silver lining to this, you know, massive homeschool movement, which we're all a part of now, is, is thinking through what are some other options, whether it's delivered through public or private. I think both types of schools are delivering online learning or paper-based remote learning uh, where needed. Uh, but but it's I think more parents through this will, will see that children can learn outside of a classroom. And maybe there's a new combination. I don't know what that looks like. I think we're all still making our way through this. But uh, perhaps this is an opportunity where some minds can be opened and, and we can see some innovation in that regard. So this is a really substantive brief that covers all of the areas of uh, of the whole education um, issue from a national level to a very local level. So so what can you do? Where, where do you start um, wanting to be engaged? You know, starting to discuss this brief allows you to find your, your focus and where you can apply your expertise, your talent, your preoccupation uh, to one specific areas. And um, we, uh, you can, you can dig into additional resources for you know, understanding various reform options in the education system and the way it's run. You you can focus on um, curriculum in, in your school. And uh, you can also write, engage with your legislators about their views and start a dialogue um, uh, with them about what they're thinking about education uh, in, in your city and in your state. Um, as Beth suggested, attending school board meetings and reviewing the annual budgets um, is really important. You can ask to meet for coffee with a school board member to find out about priorities and share information with them. Uh, you can yeah. And just a note on that, your school board members in many cases, um, probably most cases, they are volunteers, and so they are usually serving as community members, and they are often parents and your neighbor and people, and so getting to know them um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis really is a great way to establish rapport um, and then and kind of learn about what their perspectives are. So it's really, I think it's in some ways also, I think it's important to do both where you can meet them individually as well as attend them, you know, in a collect, attend seeing them in a collective meeting um, that there's really value in both. Yeah, it's true that there's really value in building reports. And when we do, you do show up with a major issue at a school board meeting, you already know them on a personal basis. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, there's also, you know, volunteering, of course, at, at your school is a great way to learn how the school is run and how decisions are made. And, uh, and then find out if your state offers tax credit or similar scholarship uh, and support them through your business or on a personal basis for to give 
others uh, the choice of finding a school that fits uh, their kids' learning um, learning pattern. Uh, you know, you can also find an organization volunteer as a mentor or volunteer as a tutor. Many organizations, especially in low-income communities, are in need of consistent volunteers. Organizations such as Take Stock and Children in Florida are good examples, and there's also churches and other religious institutions that often know of reputable programs in, in need of help. Um, you can also support an after-school program where you can share your professional talents, uh, such as teaching cooking, chess, home economics, gardening, accounting, um, programming, and meet with a family who chooses private school as an option. Ask their views on public education versus private. Um, we also have developed another policy circle brief on education savings account uh, that is uh, available in our library, and that could be the topic of another. Uh, another. Beth, do you have some share on what can you do, and, and perhaps you can share a little bit of what you've done, I know, in, in uh, our area? Sure. So through the group you mentioned at the beginning of the brief, new, brief new chair, uh, of our discussion, New Chair Neighbors, uh, we have shown up at school board meetings and really tried to better understand the budget, how resources are deployed. Uh, we've taken a hard look at curriculum choices that the school has made, and, you know, some are, some are good, some are not good, and have just tried to express views and, and some input uh, to the schools so that they can... You don't know what parent concerns are and taxpayer concerns are um, because at the end of the day, they they really do work for us. I mean, if you think about it, they are a public service and they should be responsive that way. And I think we've had, you know, some success. The, um, you know, I think obviously knowing what's going on in your school and you listed quite a few ways that you can do that by volunteering, getting to know people on the school board, um, you know, really taking advantage of teacher conferences, making sure that you show up when you're, when you have the opportunity, um, to talk about with a teacher about your child. And then as well, um, you know, be in the classroom really helps you understand really the wonderful job that a lot of teachers do. I mean, they really are so many good teachers out there and, um, it's important to understand the many, you know, things that go into creating a great classroom, you know, and what teachers can and can't do. I mean, parents are obviously, you know, if not the biggest influence on a child in their education, and yeah, and I mean, understanding the administrative structure yes. of the school is something that I would never have thought of doing. Um, you know, when when I first started sending my kids to school, I never really had that thought. And but I, it's a really important one to be to be part of that. And there's a number of committees and task force that also involve the community uh, and tackle specific uh, topics that uh, you could be a voice in. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe we can conclude with um, summarizing here in the brief. There's some uh, thought leaders and additional resources that you could follow. Ed Choice is is one organization um, that has uh, detailed arguments and data in support of parent choice in schooling. Uh, Michael McShane has a short book. It's called Education and Opportunity, which outlines how a wiser use of technology in a marketplace of education option can help today's students succeed in tomorrow's economy. Uh, Mike Petrilli of the Fordham Institute uh, has education for upward mobility. And then Howard Fuller, who designed the first voucher system on Education America. Uh, we have a video here of Howard Fuller in uh, Milwaukee. There's also economist Roland Fryer, who's a founder and faculty director of the Education Innovation Laboratory at Harvard University, on one, why he was drawn to education reform and why accidents of birth should not determine our access to high-quality education. Uh, so there's several projects um, that um, that Dr. Fryer uh, leads. There's also 50can.org is an education reform organization that advocates for the principles of transparency, choice, accountability, equity, and flexibility in our school system. Uh, education Trust is a nonprofit organization that promotes closing opportunity gaps by expanding excellence and equity in education for students of color and those from low-income families from pre-kindergarten through college. Uh, the Foundation for Excellence in Education focuses on personalized learning in addition to choice and accountability. And then there's the American Federation for Children, 
which uh, is website compiles data on parent choice programs available across various states with an easy to use map. And there's also a Ed Choice publish a dashboard that has a helpful overview of parent choice options um, that can be refined by type and state. So Kellogg Northwestern Factbook on Education provide global and national facts on education. And then, uh, Beth, you were mentioning uh, Miss Virginia, but there's other documentaries. Maybe you can tack on that. Sure. So there's the 2014 documentary called The Ticket that outlines the different ways school choice is developing across the country. And we include a link to the trailer for it. And then, of course, there is the 2010 documentary Waiting for Superman by award-winning filmmaker Davis Guggenheim, which explores the America's broken education system. And uh, that that's another one I would I would highly recommend. Lots of good information in that. So great. Well, you know, each brief come with a discussion guide and uh, in which, you know, you could drive a full discussion and then decide on how to engage. So with that, I'd like to conclude our podcast today. And Beth, thank you for um, um, doing this with us. And I think this is a really great overview and a starting point. So I encourage you to discuss education K-12 in uh, your circle, whether in enterprise, in your association, in, uh, in your community. So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Sylvie. Thanks for having me.